and welcome to today's lecture on Chapter 3, Communication and Culture. Culture is defined as the language, values, beliefs, traditions, and customs that people share and learn. As I'm sharing with you today the information contained in Chapter 3, I want you to think about what you think about when you hear the word culture, because it encompasses so many terms, right? It can, it, I think about personally food. I don't know about you, but I love food and I love eating food and experiencing food from different cultures. Culture also is represented by language and customs and religion and clothing and holidays and traditions and so many things. But back to the lecture. Cultural differences are salient in some situations, but not in others. So what does that mean? Salience is the term in which we attach weight to cultural characteristics in certain situations. So cultural differences can be relevant. They can be important. Well, they are important, but they can be, they can have more weight attached to them depending on the people interacting and the situation. Now, one thing I want to discuss is in-group and out-group. So people whom, with which we identify are considered in-group and others are out-group. So think about it. It makes sense. They're people that we have a connection with, that we share commonalities with, and we tend to gravitate towards people that we have things in common with. A co-culture is a group of that is part of an overarching, encompassing, larger culture. And we're going to talk more about co-cultures in just a moment. And the last term I want you to be aware of, so we talked about culture, we talked about salience, and we talked about co-culture, is intersectionality. And intersectionality describes the complex interplay of people's multiple identities. So think about it. You can have a lot of connections with different cultures and co-cultures, depending on your background. So let's talk about co-cultures, which again, are the membership of a group in a part of an, a larger encompassing culture. Now think about the United States. We are a melting pot. We have so many different nationalities and ethnicities represented in the United States of America because so many people came here when the country was was founded. So let's talk about co-cultures and some examples of co-cultures. So race and ethnicity are definitely co-cultures and I want to break down the definitions of each of these terms. So race was a social construct originally created to explain the differences among people whose ancestors originated in different parts of the world. So for example, if your ancestors came from Africa or Asia or Europe, and that's how the, the term race came to be. Ethnicity is the degree to which a person identifies with a particular group, usually on the basis of nationality, culture, religion, etc. So race and ethnicity are co-cultures. Also, there's regional differences. Think about this. You may identify as an American, but there are people in the U.S. that are widely and vastly different, whether you live in the Northeast or you live in the South or you live in the Midwest or the Far West. So regional differences can affect culture. Also, sexual orientation and gender have a big part in people's cultural identity. And we're gonna talk more about that in a moment. Also religion. Religion is very dear and very important to people and therefore is considered a co-culture. Socioeconomic status also is important as a co-culture, as is political viewpoints. And not we are seeing that more and more each day, unfortunately, as our country is very divided amongst its political factions. Also, ability and disability is part of a co-culture, and that needs to be understood, it needs to be respected, and it needs to be acknowledged. Now, let's talk about age and generation. So, 
I want you to think about all the different people that you that are in your life that you interact with, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your extended family, and to understand the 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 age gap and the generation gap because you may feel as though you have nothing in common with your parents or your grandparents, but you're more alike with them than you may think. And ideas of aging change over time. And something you need to be very aware of is that you can learn a lot from your parents and your grandparents, and you should talk to them, especially your grandparents. If you're blessed enough to have them alive and nearby, go have a conversation with them. Ask them questions. They love to talk. They love to share. And they'll feel really good that you asked them questions about their history and their background. So age and generation also have stereotypes, unfortunately, and they discourage open communication because a lot of times the younger generations don't want to talk to the older generations. And I really feel that the younger generations should open their eyes and open their ears to learn as much as possible as they can from the older generations because they're so wise and they've lived through so much. Now, let's talk about you. Being young definitely has its challenges. It's not easy growing up in today's world and with today's technology and social media and all the things that you have at your fingertips. And you'll hear me talk about this a lot in class on just how different communication is and how social media and the internet has changed relationships and communication and has actually made it Although it's made it simple and easy, it's also complicated a lot of things. Now, generations regard technology differently. We're also going to talk about that. I know that many of you have grandparents that are probably using a cell phone for the first time or, or don't know how to operate it. I know that my mother has an iPhone and she doesn't even barely use it to its fullest potential. And she would much rather have a phone call than a text any day of the week. So remember, not everyone views technology the way you do. And you need to meet the receiver where they are at. Because just because it's easier for you doesn't mean it's the channel that they want to receive their message in. I can guarantee you that your parents and your, especially your grandparents, would love a phone call and would love a face-to-face -face visit a lot more than a text because it's a lot more sincere and genuine. And age and generation gaps also, um, differences can emerge at work. If you work with people that are different ages than you are, sometimes there can be a little bit of a frustration because the older generations can't see things from the perspective of the younger generation and vice versa. So it's important to be open-minded and to try and put yourself in the shoes of the other person because their, their age gap can affect their communication. So let's talk back to culture and, and how we can learn more about culture. One of the reasons, or, or excuse me, one of the ways that you can do that is to seek out more cultural information. I am a faculty advisor for a club here at Georgia Highlands called Students Without Borders. And the mission of this club is to promote and generate awareness of cultural diversity and to help spread awareness amongst the people on our campuses. And we do a lot of fun activities such as going to the Atlanta Greek Festival, experiencing different cuisines from different, different cultures, we celebrated Chinese New Year. We will watch foreign films. There's so many ways that you can invite culture into your life. And I definitely encourage you to watch a movie in Spanish with English subtitles. What a great way to learn Spanish or brush up on your Spanish because I know you learned it in high school. Also, other ways you can learn about culture, confess your ignorance. You could say, this is new to me. What's the right thing to do here? You know, just because it's the way you do it, it may be different for your friend who comes from Europe or who comes from South America. So ask them how they, they do things in their country. And speaking of which, try to spend time with people from different cultural backgrounds than you. You can learn so much from them. And 
I personally find it fascinating to learn about their customs and their cultures and how they do things in their country. And lastly, be flexible. I talked about this in chapter one. You need to be flexible in this day and age in our ever-changing world. You need to shift gears or what the book calls frame switching, which is adapting one style to the norms of other people's cultural backgrounds. And the best way to do this is to study it, ask the person what they do in their country. I've traveled and I've been blessed to have been able to visit a lot of different countries in Europe and Asia and South America. And one of the first things I do before I travel to a country is to read about what is proper, what is the etiquette in that country of what can and cannot be done. Because I know that I personally never want to offend someone unknowingly. So be flexible and be open to learning from people that are different from you, because you might be surprised that you're a lot more similar than you thought you were. Also, let's talk about cultural variations. There was a researcher named Hofsteed, and he was from the Netherlands, and he devised a way to study culture and these cultural dimensions helped people to understand the similarities and the differences between different countries and different cultures. So the first dim cultural dimension that I want to talk about is individualism versus collectivism. And it's the most common and the most recognized cultural variant. And individualism is super easy because the United States of America is the most individualistic culture bar none in the entire world. Think about it. The U.S. is completely centered on the individual, the, the me, the I. It's all about me, whereas most of our world is actually collectivistic, which puts the needs of the group over the needs of the individual. So if you're, if you're interacting or communicating with someone from a collectivistic background, you may be, that may be the reason for their behavior, that they're not seeing things from your perspective because they're used to putting the team needs or the group needs before themselves. The next one is called high and low context. So let's talk about what that means. A low context person will use direct language. These are straight up people. They're gonna tell you exactly how they feel and they're not gonna mince their words. But someone from a high context culture is more subtle. They're going to use nonverbal cues. They're not gonna come out directly and tell you how they feel. They're kinda, they're gonna beat around the bush if you ever heard that saying. They're not gonna be direct. So you really have to rely on nonverbal cues to read someone from a, from a high context culture. Now, Uncertainty is definitely a part of our world, but how we deal with uncertainty is, it, it varies culture to culture. So uncertainty avoidance reflects the degree to which members of a culture feel threatened by ambiguous or awkward situations or how much they try to avoid them. So some cultures embrace that and others shy away from it. And also, I want to talk to you about power distance. And power distance is the gap between social groups with power and resources and those that have less. And if any of you have been able to travel to a third world country, you can see the stark differences in the people that have money and resources and those who do not. So nothing really humbles you like travel and experiencing culture and life from other people's perspectives because it really makes you realize how blessed you are to have what you have. And also I want to discuss and include how groups and how cultures feel about silence. The Westerners versus, versus, versus the Eastern culture. So the Westerners being the Americans. We don't really value silence. We talk a lot. Whereas a lot of Eastern cultures value silence. They say less and they listen more. And it's very important actually for all of us to listen more because there's a lot being said that we're not hearing because we're not listening. We're not paying attention to it. 
And lastly, I want to talk on cultural variance is the emphasis on either competition or cooperation. And as you can imagine, is not only is the U.S. the most individualistic culture in the world, we're also very competitive. It's always, it seems like it's a race, it's a contest, and we it's all about winning. Whereas collectivis collectivistic countries and cultures are more about cooperation and working together for the common good or the common goal. So it's it's really kind of an internal conflict when you have individualistic members and collectivistic members in a group because there is a a tug of war so to speak between the between the individual's goal and the group's goal. And sometimes you have to put your personal goal aside to do what's best for the group. So one element of culture that I want to discuss today is prejudice. And the word prejudice comes from the root word pre and the other part of the word judge. So we prejudge others with an unfair bias or an intolerant attitude towards others who are in an outgroup. Remember we talked about in-group and outgroup and how we identify with those who we have similarities with? So we tend to prejudge or have prejudice towards people that we don't know or don't understand. And I'm here to encourage you to try and get to know people that are different from you. It might be awkward or scary or weird, but I'm telling you, you will find out that you have a lot more in common with that person than you originally thought. Um, unfortunately, prejudging leads to stereotyping, which is an exaggerated generalization made about a group of people. So it's very dangerous to, to not only pre uh, to have prejudice, but also to stereotype people too. So try not to do that. Try to have an open heart and an open mind because these judgments can lead to unfair discrimination. And the discrimination can be racial, it could be sexual, it could be age discrimination. So it's very important that we, we do have an open mind and an open heart when it comes to dealing with people because we all are the same inside. We all have blood running through our veins and a heart and we're all people. We need to remember that and respect that. And we need to have mindful thinking so that we can lower our bias of people. We live in a very diverse world and a very difficult world right now with all the tensions that are going on politically and racially, and we need to rise above it. We need to realize that in the end that we're people and that we need to have respect and love for people. So I want you to think about that as we go throughout the semester. And one thing that I want to talk about when it comes to culture is the term ethnocentrism. So ethnocentrism is the, it's defined as feeling as though your culture is superior to others. And when you think about it, almost everyone is ethnocentric, right? The Americans think we're the greatest thing ever. Well, so do a lot of other countries. And it's okay to have pride, it's okay but it's not okay to put other people down and to and try to make them look bad while you're asserting that you're better than everybody. So try to be aware of this ethnocentrism and not succumb to it. And the last thing I wanted to talk about in this chapter is culture shock. So if any of you have traveled abroad or spent any amount of time abroad, you have experienced culture shock because you miss home. All of the, the, the new and the honeymoon phase of being there kind of wears off. And especially if there's a language barrier involved and you're not quite sure how to understand people. Personally, I went to China in 2018. And although it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, it was also very frustrating and very difficult because of the language barrier. And never have I felt so small not understanding the language. And I really had to rely on nonverbal and... Google Translate. But back to culture shock, don't be too hard on yourself. Know that it's normal to experience these feelings. Um, homesickness is completely normal and it's okay to feel those feelings. Also to 
when you are visiting another country, it's normal to expect progress and also to expect setbacks. You're gonna take two steps forward and then you may take a step back. You may have a good day and then have a bad day. But remember, it's getting up and, and getting right back at it the next day. It's okay to feel bad or have a, have a bad day. Just get right back on the horse the next day and keep riding. And also reach out to others. Don't, don't take everything personally and, and don't keep it to yourself. Talk to someone, share your experiences with someone so you'll, you won't feel so alone and you'll know that you've got people that are going through the same exact thing that you are. So today we've discussed chapter three, communication and culture. Culture is all around us. You don't have to get on a plane to experience it. So get on out there and experience all that this beautiful world has to offer you.